Hi, this is Denise LaRosa, and you're listening to Mom Talk with Denise LaRosa, where moms get together to share our joys and challenges, while also providing listeners with some invaluable resources and information on parenting. Thank you for joining me today. Remember, this show is about you, so please become an active participant by visiting www.deniseandlarosa.com, liking my Facebook page, Mom Talk with Denise LaRosa, and follow me on Twitter at Denise and LaRosa. Today's guest is a man who is wise beyond his years and is a model for how a mother's love has the power to shape a child's life in such a way that it has a profound impact on both himself and those around him. Author, personal trainer, and life coach Sharif K. Rashid is a Wright State University graduate and recipient of the Sociology Outstanding Alumni Award. Inspired by life experiences, he felt compelled to write a book that offers steps for women to experience positive relationships and achieve happiness with others and, most importantly, yourself. In his book, Women Are You Serious? A Guidebook for Relationships and Happiness, Mr. Rashid helps women look at the way they perceive love and relationships and how the common denominator for success begins with loving and relating to yourself. I recently spoke with Sharif about his mother's powerful influence on his life, how she inspires him daily, and how that inspiration has translated into a book that can help so many women. And I read your book, Women Are You Serious? And I am going to be totally honest with you. I was thinking, Sharif, are you serious? You're going to tell me about me? And I read it, and you were spot on. Well, I appreciate that. And I, 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 when I wrote the book, my thing was, like, a lot of women are probably going to be like, who's this guy? Is this like a Steve Harvey think like a man type thing? But I didn't want to come from a traditional like a traditional point of view, I guess, where guys just telling women what to do or being misogynistic or anything like that. I just wanted to use the experience that my mom taught me and that I've seen from women and just kind of just give my feedback with it. That's all. Yeah, and that's exactly what it is. And I think that's why it really resonated with me. You know, just like you said, you're not coming at this like, I'm going to tell you about you. You were just sharing your experiences through your mom. And that yeah. just really touched me. And so I think that's why I was able to connect with it because I could just tell that your mom was such, like she is such an amazing woman. So uh, tell me a little bit more about your mom and how she inspired you to write the book. Um, let's see. My mom, I mean, me and my mom are real close. We have a real close relationship. Um, she, she's from New York. Uh, she was a single parent that raised me and my brother. Um, we grew up in Colorado. Um, but my mom, see, the thing I like about my mom is when we were young, she didn't have a lot of education. She worked at Burger King, two jobs, and just always worked hard, worked hard, and um, and everything. And just built her way up and always worked her way up um, just growing up. So it was real It was real tough just growing up in a single-parent household with me and my brother. Um, but she's always, my mom, the one thing she always did with me and my brother was she was honest with us. <laughs> she never lied. She never gave us some type of false hope about something. She was very honest, very direct. That's why me and my mom are really close today. Um, now today she's working. Actually, she's working on her doctor's degree, which I'm happy for. Um, wow. But she's just one of those women who, if it's right, she's going to say it's right. And if it's wrong, she's going to say it's wrong. And there's no there's no middle. It says, I'm going to call it what it is. And that's what I wanted to do with my book. I wanted to call it what it is. I wanted to eliminate the gray area. I wanted to just yes. make it. It's, I like to call it deep common sense thinking. A lot of stuff in the book is common sense thinking. You know what I mean? If somebody's treating you bad, don't stay. And it's not like I don't want to go deeper than that. It shouldn't be like, well, you should work out the differences. If somebody's disrespecting you, then why would you want to stay with that person who's disrespecting you? Because eventually you're going to start disrespecting yourself. Exactly. Exactly. The thing I wanted to and- portray. I wanted to. Common, just common sense. That's all. Just common sense in the most basic way. But from a perspective that I get from my mom, because my mom read the book. It took my mom a while to read the book because that's just my mom. I know her. I could talk to her about when I was as I was writing the book, I would talk to her about certain things, and she would be like, "What are you talking about, boy?" Um, <laughs> but she didn't really understand it. But um, as she read it, my mom actually like cried after she read it because she was like, "You actually paid attention." I was like, "Yes, I paid attention." even though sometimes I wasn't trying to hear you or you were yelling at me, but I paid attention to the things you, you were saying and I picked up on it and it stuck with me. And it was just, even though, even though I'm not a woman, but the same, the same thing that goes towards a relationship, I can apply even with the book though. You know what I mean? Right. Exactly. Yeah. And it just brings me to the next question because I just, 
love hearing about your relationship with your mom. And there was um, a quote that – there were so many quotes. Like, you should see my notebook. It's, like, full of quotes from your book. <laughs> and uh, one of them is, love is a woman's most powerful ability, pure, untainted love. And you were speaking about how you didn't appreciate your mom's love uh, as a child, and you even compared it to suffocating, which I know a lot of kids can relate Mm -hmm. to, uh, both uh, grown kids and little ones now. And Mm -hmm. so what changed you? At what point in your life did you open your eyes and realize that that love, you were able to describe it as something other than suffocating, I guess? Um, I would say when I graduated high school, I'm not even going to lie, when I was like, I was. I graduated June. I'll never forget it. I graduated June fourth, two thousand four. I moved out June seventh, two thousand four. I was ready to go. You know, I was. Mm-hmm. Hey, whatever. I, my mom, she's been getting on my nerves and everything like that. I'm old. I'm grown. And I think it was maybe June twenty second. I realized I miss my mom. And you just oh, start wow. realizing like all the things she did for you, and, and you just start appreciating. And I was like, man, my mom. She really prepared me for the real world. And that's what I said. That's the one thing. My mom prepared me for the real world. She taught me how to wash clothes. She taught me how to budget. She taught me how to survive. She taught me how to turn a penny into $5. She taught me how to shop, how to, you know, save money on bills and stuff like that. She really prepared me. At the time, it was just this woman is just doing too much. She's yelling at me for leaving the light on or she's yelling at me for leaving the fridge open. Not necessarily yelling, but Mm -hmm. she's just commenting on everything I do, and it was like, as I got older, I started realizing, oh, my God, she was really teaching me a lot just about life. And I see that with a lot of my friends, that when they graduated high school, they weren't prepared to survive. Me and they depended on mommy and daddy still, whereas I was I was on my own, 17, I graduated. Um, so I moved out at 17, and I was able to take care of myself, doing my laundry, because I learned how to do my laundry when I was in fifth grade. Um, I learned how to cook when I was 11. My mom taught me how to cook because being a single mom, she wasn't always going to be there. And I had my older brother, so we was always, you know, safe and everything. But I learned, had to learn how to cook because I had to learn how to eat. I had to eat. So she was like, you know, I'm going to teach you how to cook. So I would, me and my mom would just cook, and she would just teach me her recipes and everything like that. So she taught me a lot about life at a young age, and I really didn't start realizing it. Around June 22nd, that's when I can even put it to a date is when I really started to appreciate my mom. I even called her, Mom, I love you. You know what I mean? And I just let her know. That sometimes, I, me and my mom, every time we talk, we always say I love you. And we talk maybe five, six times a week. I'm 28 years old, and we still talk almost every day. And we're very honest with our conversation. And my mom even said as a kid, she's like, when we're growing up, I'm your parent. Now I'm your friend. And my mom is my friend. And growing up, she was my parent. Now she's my friend. But I'm glad that I have a person that I can tell anything to. No judgment. Good, bad, I can tell my mom. Right or wrong, I can tell my mom. She's going to have my back 100%, and I really love her for that. Uh, that's incredible, and I just – we have that in common. It's so many layers of what you were saying that I can totally relate to, and I also grew up in a single-parent home, and my mom was a working mom, and I to her – it's funny because she's actually here now helping me watch my kids, so – uh, you know, we're very, very close, and she taught me a lot about independence and a lot of the things that um, you mentioned in your book and that you're talking about now. And I just, I really appreciate your perspective in so many ways. And you really talk a lot about relationships and how uh, you it starts with yourself. Like another quote mm-hmm. is, a successful relationship starts with a successful self. And I think that was just really, it's common sense, like you said, but how many women and men, you know, end up going into a relationship trying to love someone, but they don't love themselves? Sure. I actually have a client that I work with now, and I'm not going to divulge like, any personal information, but the one thing that stuck out with her was, oh, my God, I love somebody more than I love myself. And like I said, I, I even made a comment in the book, this does not include your children. Every mother is going to love their children more than they love themselves. That's that's a fact. So I even made a comment on that in the book. But but what she was talking about was what made her happy was the love she gave other people. And I was like, but well, what makes you happy? You got to make yourself happy. Your happiness can't be based on the love that that others experience. You're not experiencing love yourself. And when you experience love yourself, it's a very beautiful thing. 
Mm-hmm. It's a very empowering thing because you know that you believe in yourself. You don't doubt yourself. You don't have these negative ideas about yourself. Because a person who doesn't love themselves tends to beat up themselves emotionally. And that's one thing that I never, I never, I never liked about women. And I always wanted, oh, let me, let me talk to you real quick. Or let me just see what you're saying. Let me hear you out because a lot of times you don't have an outlet. You might think you have an outlet, but I'm going to tell you like this. When you talk to me, I'm not going to comment unless you want me to comment, but I will listen. Yeah. And that's one thing I guess that I'm pretty good at. I'm a great listener. I don't always have to speak. I can just shake my head and be like, I hear what you're saying. And I'll engage in the conversation. But it's just I really believe that a lot of women need to, or I'm not going to say need to, but a lot of women are, it's a very powerful thing when you see a woman who loves herself, I believe. And I believe that the woman is the, you know, she could teach the child even when she has children that, you know, about loving herself. And it can always, it can start a new cycle or a new tradition of just self-love and self-empowerment. Yes. And it seems like your relationship is so much healthier. You you don't have these um, just out there expectations that just cannot mm-hmm. be met by another person. I think when you're looking for so much um, from somebody that they just aren't capable of giving, you know, like you just, yeah. it, it really does start with yourself. And that was just amazing how you um, brought that to the forefront from the very beginning. And mm-hmm. like you said, beating yourself up, like uh, you said this in a way that I had never heard before. And it's just so spot on yet again, but beating yourself up uh, with the exaggeration of the truth. I mean, how often is it that we, you know, experience life, and by the time we've uh, cycled it through in our minds and our spirits, it's just like way bigger. The situation is way bigger, way more exaggerated than it really was. Yeah. And it's one thing that I think a lot of people really need to pay attention to, that the truth is always simple. Always. Mm-hmm. But if you start exaggerating and, you know, when you start exaggerating, you start adding lies to the truth. I mean, there's, there's still truth and exaggeration, but you start adding lies to it, which means that's when it becomes exaggerated. And if you're not embracing the truth at its simplest form, then you just, you're never going to find that peace. And the one thing I even always say about love, too, is that I, I heard this a lot, that, oh, that's just how he loves or that's just how she loves or they weren't. That's not the case. Love is simple. People make it complicated. Love is an emotion. Happiness is simple. Sadness is simple. We we try to understand it. That's the problem. You can't put love in a box. You can't put happiness in a box. When you actually love, you feel it. You can show it. You can express it. It comes out your pores. It's the same thing. You have to trust your emotions. When you're happy, you can't you can't hide a smile. When you're sad, you can try to stop, but you you're sad. It's your emotion. You really have to trust your emotions. And I think a lot of times is that people try to put love or happiness or sadness in a box, and it leads to somebody believing that there's different forms of love. No, there's love, and that's it. Embrace love at its truest form because there's only one form, and if we start adding things into love, we're taken away from what love really is. Love is pure. You know what I mean? Loving, and it embodies so many different emotions. You can be in love and be sad. You can be in love and be happy. You can just be in love and be neutral. But love is it's almost like, and that's the thing, let me, let me say this too. That's the thing that I had to find out myself, that I had to find out what love is. And I went through, you know, I went through a breakup. We all go through breakups. And what happens? We tend to keep to ourselves for a little bit, right? We go through that period of, I'm just down. That's why I said even at the beginning, the whole, the test, it starts with the test. You go through the whole self-doubting and, the acceptance and the awareness. I went through that, and I found out during that process what love is, and I found out that I'm not sad because, well, I feel like I'm sad because somebody left my life, but I'm not even paying attention to myself right now. I'm paying attention to somebody else. I'm, I keep saying, well, she left me, so I'm sad, or this, that, and a third, so I'm sad. I never said, you know what, Sharif, you're a great guy. It didn't work out. Don't be sad. Just love yourself. Because if you love yourself, somebody will always love you. That's one thing that's very important. If you love yourself, you will always be loved in this world. Wow. That's amazing. Wow. That is crazy because, like you said, this is all common sense, but it's so profound. Because 
like you said, we make it complicated. And another thing that we complicate is this whole bad boy thing. And Mm -hmm. I just, I'm guilty of it. I'm not going to lie. I, I, (laughs) at one point in my life, was guilty of, you know, being intrigued by the bad boy. And you were just talking about, in your book, um, you know, the bad boy effect versus a friend and how uh, oftentimes women, if you find yourself with a bad boy, you're looking for a project. And who needs a project? I mean, Mm -hmm. so, you know, like, it's it's insane that we do that. Oh, trust me. I see. And the reason, the reason I even put that in there, because I wasn't going to put it in there, because it's going to sound like I'm bitter, and I'm not. Mm-hmm. But it's just something I've always noticed. I've always had a lot of female friends growing up. Um, I guess that you know, being raised by my mom, I've always been comfortable around females. Her friends, you know, always females. So just a lot of females in and out, like her friends and stuff like that, and family members. So I was always comfortable with females. And you know, I'm always I got put in friends on a lot. That's not even something I, I don't hide that. I don't deny that. But you learn a lot from it. I, Mm-hmm. I've learned a lot from women. Like, that's really, I give a lot of women, even what is dedicated to all the women that, you know, help change and my views and everything like that, so the book's dedicated to. But I've seen it so many times, and I can tell you how it's going to begin and how it's going to end. It always ends bad. Yes. It doesn't work because you can't, you can't look at somebody as a project because you're putting too much interest into them and not into the relationship. Relationship is about putting something, you both meet it. Okay, you got C and you got A and you both meet a B. That's if you just want to make it very basic. And then when you got a project, you're skipping over B and just meeting them at C, which means you're not putting Mm -hmm. any interest into the relationship. You're just putting your interest into a person. You know what I mean? So you're not focusing on the relationship, so you're missing so many things that go into a relationship. Relationships have ups and downs. Your relationship is just down because you're focusing on changing somebody into what you really want instead of having what you really want, which is in front of you. But, you know. I've seen it so many times, though, and I just, honestly, it's one of those things when I was younger, I probably was mad, I guess a little upset, because I was like, what? I'm a better guy than this guy, but I don't get the chance because I'm too nice or I'm too respectful. But it's it's not about trying to change somebody. It's just about finding happiness. How can you find happiness in somebody that you honestly don't want to be with? You just want to fix them. Right. Or you want to change something about them. That's not happiness. That's a job. That's what you're yeah. doing. You're going to work. You're waking up, you're going to 9 to 5 at your boyfriend's house, and then you're going home and you're just like, I can't stand this. Five years down the line, uh-huh. oh, my God, what did I do wrong? Or two months down the line, oh, my God, I can't believe I did this. And then that's when it starts, you know, you start doing what you don't want to, you start doing what you don't want to do. You stay with somebody you don't truly want to be with. And you really start realizing that, and then the person you should have been with the whole time is sitting there like, I told you. <laughs> and that's right. the reason I didn't want to write. That, that was one of those chapters that... I wrote it, deleted it, I deleted it, and then I wrote it again, and then I deleted it again. Then I added it again because I was like, you know what, let's put this in here because I've seen so many women go through this. But let me write it a little differently because I didn't, like mm-hmm. I said, I don't want to write this book from a perspective of being angry. And when I first wrote this book, the book was angry. It, come, mm-hmm. it came off as I'm telling women what to do or y'all all played me when I was younger or something like that. And I was like 100 pages deleted. Over, start over, start fresh. Now, a lot of people that that was hard. Now, to me, it was hard because it was five, six months to get to those hundred pages. I just deleted it right. all, and I was like, you know what? This isn't who I am. I'm not an angry person. I'm not a bitter person. I'm a very happy person, and I'm at peace where I'm at now. So let me write from that perspective. Let me embrace mm-hmm. that that sense of love, and let me tell some things I had, and let's not go into this and feel like. I don't want to, you know, I don't want to be rude to anybody. And that's, I wanted to go in there with just a free mind and free thoughts and just pure intentions and just write a book. And that's why I put the section back in there because I feel like it's a very important section because it resonates with a lot of women who, especially younger, who tend to do things like, Mm -hmm. you know, go for the project type. Yes, it's so true. I mean, yeah, the truth hurts sometimes, but you know what? Uh, It's necessary to hear to hear in order to heal and move on and not repeat those mistakes. And Mm -hmm. it's funny because I'm 33 now, but boy, like 10 years ago, I was in a completely, totally different mindset. And it just, reading this now, like, yes, I'm married and, you know, I've kind of, Mm -hmm. you know, hopefully moved past that phase. But at the same time, it didn't hurt to look back and then kind of make sense of all that was happening. Because I think I probably, like after reading this book, 
there were a lot of things that I don't necessarily think I had totally healed from, from mistakes in the past. And you don't want to bring those mistakes into a relationship because it just really, like you said, a love is not complicated. We can make it complicated. And one of the ways we do that is by dredging up the past and bringing it yeah. from one relationship to the next. Yeah, excess baggage. Right. Yeah. And so one piece that you, um, one component that was really big, which um, probably won't be a huge surprise to anyone, is communication. And this is just an ongoing issue uh, in a marriage, a dating relationship. Uh, but you were talking about the role that communication plays in a relationship. And uh, one of the things that really stood out to me is a relationship should never have more than two voices. And how often do we tell everybody our business and then we're just left with probably about a dozen voices in our relationship? Yep. And that's the oh. I love writing that section, to be honest, because I see it so many times. Just because of what social media is today, what you see on yeah. social media is when somebody's going through something, they put their business on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter or whatever social media there is. There's just too many to keep up with, but there's a lot. Mm -hmm. And when you start doing that stuff, you're doing it. At, you're doing it at a, it's an emotional response. You're either angry, happy, sad, whatever it may be. You're putting that out there because you're responding to something emotional that may that may have just happened today, yesterday, or whatever. Um, and so when you do that, people are going to comment. And mm -hmm. as you start realizing that, you know, I'm really not that angry, people are still commenting. You can't take that. Once you put it out there, it's out there. So they're commenting. They're saying something like, oh, you need to leave him anyway. So what happens a week from now are you, when you're still together? I can't believe you're still with him or this, that, or third. And then you're sitting there like, uh, why are you talking negative about my boyfriend or my husband? Well, you put it out there. Relationships are a very private thing. I believe. I believe it's always going to be one plus one. If you get, if you put, if you put your relationship in a public atmosphere, you're giving people the right to to comment on it. You're giving them a voice. That that's the thing I think a lot of people don't pay attention to. Whether you're making something good or something negative, whether it's something positive a post or something negative on the post. You're giving people a voice. They got a voice. They feel like they're entitled. People feel entitled to give their opinion once it's on their timeline or, or whatever, Twitter feed or whatever you want to call it. They have an opinion now because it's out there. And you put it out there because you want comments. You want that attention. You want people to like it or you want people to agree with you. But instead of just talking to the person that you're mad at or or you're, just, you're in a great spot with, just celebrating with you two, Put it on the social media is always going to lead to something negative, in my opinion. Whether it's now, two years from now, it's it's a possibility. I believe that it's not a private thing. That's why I like to tell people it's not about being private or being secretive. It's about being having a personal relationship with a person. I don't need to put my business out there. I'm happy. I can put that, I'm happy. That can be a status right there. It doesn't need to be, I'm happy because this, that, and third, or I'm sad because he did this and I don't know what to do and I don't know if I should stay with him. Okay, stop. I tell all my friends, all my clients, when I work with them, the first thing I say, don't post anything on social media for a week that's personal. Don't do it. Mm. They, all, they all find it hard. And I'm, it's, it's, not, it's, it's a very hard thing when you're comfortable doing it, but when you stop doing it, you'll find out how great you really feel or how great it is to, you know, not have people in your business all the time. It's a great right. thing to have a personal relationship with one person. It's one plus one, not two plus one, not three plus one, not four plus one, and so on and so forth. But if you have that personal relationship with somebody and everything you do, communication it becomes natural. And I'll tell you this one story. I was talking with a client of mine. Um, when I say client, I'm a life coach. So these are like clients that I have. But her thing was she called me and we were talking and she was like, well, he said this and we're doing this. And the first thing I asked, did you talk to him? No. Well, let's end this conversation right here. You go call him, then you can call me back. There's no need to be a third party. Go talk to him. Right. And she was hmm. like, oh, see, common sense. You go talk to him, you take the middleman out. Don't make it gray, black and white. And then after that, she called him, talked to him, and then called me back. And our conversation was probably five, ten minutes. So I, it would have been an hour conversation of maybe her complaining about what's going on and being confused. If you don't want to be in the dark, then go turn the lights on. The best way to go turn the lights on is go to the source. 
Ask them yeah. what's going on. I don't. Why'd you do this? That's the best thing to do. Just simplify. It. If you can, if you don't feel like talking, wait a minute or two. Then go talk. But always go to the source. You don't need to come to me. Yes. You need right. to go to the person that you're mad at. Handle your handle your business like a grown woman. Absolutely. Yeah, and, and you know what? Like I... a grown woman, you'll find out. You'll find out how how easy or how it might be a misunderstanding, miscommunication. You'll find out how easy it is and how simple it is. Yes. Now, this is one thing that's an extension of that that you um, talk about in your book um, where you were speaking about um, sometimes we just aren't straight up and honest, just like you said. And you were, uh, I have this part here where you're asking, why is it so difficult for people to be honest about what they want? Is it out of fear? Uh, no, it's because you've become lazy in your relationship, assuming um, is what gets you in routines that lead you to laziness. So sometimes you just are assuming things, assuming things instead of, like you said, going straight to the source. And you were mentioning how you should always feel comfortable in your relationship to come to your partner about anything, anything that's on your mind, any questions or concerns. And uh, some people might have that fear, though, because of maybe in the past when they've come or approached that um, partner, there's this tension or defensiveness. So what would you say to um, a woman in that situation? Well, that situation, I would ask, you know, once again, I would go back to the root. Well, the first time you had, you, you encountered this tension. Was it something serious? Was it during an argument? Did you try to bring up something during an argument? Or or do you feel like this person is just somebody you really just can't talk to? And if it's somebody you really can't talk to, then you really should take a second look at your relationship because if it's something small and they're getting frustrated or it's something that you're just not letting go, maybe it's time for you to deal with what you're not letting go that you keep bringing up. Now, what do we see? We'll just use this as an example, right? Say that... Um, a guy cheated on his girlfriend, and every time, every few months she wants to bring it up, he's going to have tension because his idea, he's probably thinking, well, you stay with me. Why are we still talking about this? There's tension. We don't need to keep talking about this. If you're going to stay with somebody, just let that go and move forward. So that might be a reason for tension. But if the tension is something small like can you or can we do this tonight, and I've seen this before, can we, can we go out to eat tonight, and the guy is, just flipping out, oh, you always want to go do this, why can't we just relax, or something like that. You need to ask yourself, can you really be with somebody long-term? We're talking 10, 15, 20 years that you can't even ask basic questions to. Is it, is it really worth it? Now, and the one thing I've seen that a lot of maybe men and women experience is when you start assuming and the, the tension continues to grow because you're holding back or you're afraid to, to ask them because you're assuming that there's going to be an argument, you really, is it worth it? Nine times out of ten, it's really not worth it. It's If you can't talk to somebody, just regular stuff, just mean like how we're having a conversation right now, or we're an interview, but if I, if, you, if I was a defensive every time you asked me a question, the interview would be over. And it's the same thing that needs to happen with a relationship. If we're every, every five minutes I'm getting tense or... Every two minutes, I'm ugh, just stop talking. I'm rolling my eyes or snapping my neck or I'm just, ugh, just leave me alone. What kind of relationship is that? That's, that's no relationship for anybody because what's going to happen is somebody's going to shut down and the relationship's going to be a built-up frustration with awkward tension because tension grows. It builds and builds and it builds and it builds and to the point to where it explodes. And then it goes down and it builds and it builds, but it never goes away. There's just some people just aren't meant to be together. And if there's somebody, like I said, if you just really can't talk to them about basic stuff or even big stuff, and there's always tension, then that line, that line of communication, it's already destroyed. Communication is one of the things, a lot of times, well, not a lot of times, but sometimes when it's, when it's so petty over something so small, it's never going to work. And I think that's something that a lot of people just need to just deal with and accept. Yes. 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 Well, you know, this is just something that I really hope that I wish you the best with this book. Um, Women, Are You Serious? A guidebook for relationships and happiness. You got it. And 
I just want uh, ladies to pick it up. I mean, I'm married, and it was a valuable resource to me. I don't think it matters if you're single or married or if you're younger or older. I think it's really, truly an an excellent guidebook for um, women across the board. So I just wish you the best. Oh, I appreciate that. Thank you. You got it. So much, because you know, I like how you take your time out, even interview me. I really appreciate it. Thank you for tuning in. Be sure to stay in touch with me by visiting www.deniseandlarosa.com. You have been listening to Mom Talk with Denise LaRosa. I will leave you with this African proverb. The source of human love is the mother. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much for checking out this video. Be sure to subscribe to my YouTube channel. You can also check out these additional videos. Follow me on Facebook at Mom Talk with Denise LaRosa and Twitter at Denise and LaRosa. Be sure to also comment below and let me know what you think about these videos and what you would like to see in the future.